ERC platform. This week we have been studying on the topic of ecclesiology and we are blessed to have the servant of God, Brother Biju Jacob John, whom the Lord has been using mightily to teach us on this topic. We have uh, learned about this topic throughout uh, the last few days. We saw that the church is the possession of God, which he purchased by his own blood. And it is the house of God. And it is also the pillar and ground of the truth. And Lord is the master of the church and he is at the center of it. And we also have seen that there is universal church and there is local church and there are rules and order and government for the church which is set by the Lord himself. So it is a, a, an important topic what we all should learn and be mindful of it. So even today, dear brother Biju John will continue the class on this same topic. And before we hand it, uh, hand over the session to him, let us seek the blessing of the Lord for today's session. And at the end, the Indy Joseph from Vashi will be closing the session with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to thy presence through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank thee for this wonderful privilege and blessing what we, we have received through him, that we can call thee, Abba Father, entering into thy holy est of holy presence with courage and boldness, because we have been covered by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we belong to the church of God, which is purchased by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, Father God, we thank thee and praise thee for this new day that you have given us another opportunity to come together to learn thy word. Father God, we, uh, we realize though we are not wise people of this world, but it thou has illuminated our hearts and given us light in our mind and enabled us to understand the great oracles of the Lord, which thou hast given us in thy word. O Lord, we thank thee and praise thee for thy servant, whom thou hast, thou hast prepared to teach us from thy word. O Lord, thank thee for everyone who have joined from different parts of the world this morning. And we commit today's session into thy mighty hands, that thou may take control of today's session. We might have smooth. Uh, internet connectivity and all the logistics may work smoothly. We might not have any problem. Oh Lord, we pray. And we pray that today's session will be a great blessing for all of us, that we might understand the great truth of the Lord and about the church of God. And we may understand and behave accordingly as per the rules which are set by thee in thy word. Oh Father God, we thank thee and praise thee for this work of Turk and thou hast been using this platform to teach uh, us uh, about different topics of thy word, which is very important for us to understand, O oh Father. We thank thee for all the faculties, all the brothers who are working behind this, and we commit all of them into thy hands once again, that thou might bless them and use them uh, for thy glory till the coming of our Lord. O oh, Father God, once again, we commit today's session into thy presence. Especially we pray for thy servant, Brother Biju uh, John. We pray that uh, thou might fill him with the Holy Spirit, giving give him word from above, that he will be able to teach us uh, thy word uh, in a very mighty way, O oh, Father God. We thank thee and praise thee. We give you all glory, honor, power, and majesty. In the wonderful and precious name of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Over to you, Brother Vijay John. Yeah. Thank you, Brother Job. It is a great privilege and honor to 
take these classes and I'm not worthy, but thank you that you're all tuned in and uh, let's look to the Lord in prayer that he may illumine our hearts with his precious word. So we have been uh, seeing uh, certain things about the church of God and we have been talking about the government of the church, which is a local church. I'll start with saying a small incident which happened when Jonathan Whitefield was talking to the miners, coal miners in England. He asked one man, what do you believe? So he said, well, I believe the same as the church. Then the question was asked, what does the church believe? Oh, well, they believe the same as me. Seeing that he was getting nowhere, Whitefield said, oh, what is that you both believe? The answer was, well, I suppose it's the same thing. Many Christians today, you know, are uh, seeming to know as much about what they believe as that coal miner. But the Lord has been merciful to us to have revealed his word to us and we are able to understand the word of God. Everything is something which is different than what the coal miners believed. He did not know what he believed the church. He said what he believes is what the church believes. And finally, he had to say that it is the same thing. So let's come to the topic of today. So I will share my screen and uh, uh, we'll let's start off with today's class. <laughs> so today uh, we will... Uh, start and uh, talk about something which is about a shepherd. When we talk about shepherds, what is that which come into your mind? Let's see. When you are looking at a shepherd, you know that you will see something which is slightly different than a white collar job. His office is kind of uh, different from what a typical office is. So we see there is a difference in what the position and the place a shepherd has compared to many other offices which we have. Now, when you look at a shepherd, a shepherd is a person who is doing a lot of effort to do something for a sheep. There is no, uh, it's a, not a 12 hour job or an eight to eight job or a nine to nine job. It is a 24 bar seven job. He has taken off his time from his family, from his friends to be with animals, to be with Somebody who is, uh, a, it's not a person, but it is an animal. And when you look at the shepherd, he has not only really one sheep, he will have a lot of sheep to look after. When you're looking after sheep, it is sometimes very interesting to note that the sheep, you know, sheep are things, animals which cannot see more than 10 feet. It is kind of a little bit of short-sighted uh, uh, one and always the shepherd has to show the way. It has to be guided. And you know, the sheep always has problems. You know, like for example, in Psalm 23, we see that there is the oil which is anointing the sheep. When the sheep gets into a problem with having a bug on his head, the flies would have come and they would have put the eggs on the head. You know, it starts growing and finally the maggots are filled uh, and the sheep experiences so much of a kind of uh, difficulty. And then comes the shepherd with the oil and anoints the uh, sheep with the oil. And what happens is he, the sheep is sometimes given something which is uh, giving it relief from that irritation of the bugs. Similarly, in the church of God, 
<clears throat> there are people who are under shepherds. <clears throat> so when you say that he's an under shepherd, what we see is that he is appointed by the Holy Spirit and he is in charge of a local assembly, not only he himself, but a team of elders who are responsible for that. Now, when you consider that a sheep is something which is very innocent, a sheep needs guidance. It is up to the shepherd to give the necessary guidance and protection. You know that you know there are wolves, there are many animals which are looking for food, and this animal is very prone to attacks from this uh, particular uh, uh, the, uh, the, the enemies which are there in the field. So there is a lot of protection which is needed from the, uh, from the enemies. So the sheep and the shepherd, we see that it is always in constant danger and the shepherd kind of protects it from all dangers. Now, when you consider a shepherd, it is a pastoral responsibility which is executed by the shepherd in the local assembly. Shepherds are raised and equipped by the Holy Spirit. So let us see what are the things which a shepherd does when he is equipped by the Holy Spirit. There are a lot of things which he does. The first one, let us read 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2. It is feeding the flock among you. Feeding the flock among you. Let's read that portion. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. So you see that here is a particular uh, 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 exercise which is to be done of feeding. If the sheep is not fed, what happens? It dies. So it is the flock which is entrusted to the care of the shepherd. And the sheep has to be fed in different places. So when you see a sheep, you will see that it will graze on a particular area for some time and the area becomes devoid of grass and the person has to go and kind of find fresh pasture every time. So feeding the church of God from fresh pastures, it is not something that he can be in one particular place at the same time, every time. So there is fresh pasture which is needed for the sheep. And the, the previous day, the shepherd would have gone and seen, where do we go today? Similarly, there is a guidance which is given to the sheep by the shepherd. Can we read Psalm 78 and 52, so which says that the Lord God led the children of Israel and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. So guidance is something which is necessary for the sheep and the shepherds do that. Psalm 78 and 52, please. But made his own people to go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. Now, the third thing is tending. You know, uh, I would like to uh, use this word tending because when you imagine what is tending, you know, it's like a farmer going to a particular plant which is planted and just seeing carefully what is wrong if there is anything which is inspecting, if there is any problem, do something which is kind of uh, repairing the damage. So let's read Isaiah 4 and 11. He's, it's written, the, the God will, like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. It is not only really feeding and guiding, tending. Let's read Isaiah 4 and 11. That's a wrong reference, uh, Brother Biju. Okay. So, uh, sorry, uh, we will uh, go on and maybe I'll correct it later. Now, the next reference is laboring in the word and doctrine. 1 Timothy 5, 12, 17, and 2 Timothy 2, 15. 
laboring in the word and doctrine. Can uh, you read that, brother, please? Yeah, yeah, sure. Fine. Here we are. Having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 12. And verse number 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and teaching. Yeah, verse 17 also. Brother. Yeah, that's what verse 17. Yeah, and 2 Timothy 2.15, please. Yeah. Here we are. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. <clears throat> so this is a great responsibility of not only the elders, but also those who are gifted to teach that they have to labor. It is no, there's no shortcut. This is something which has to be sought for and God from the Lord, what do you have to speak every time you speak? It is the word of God and the Lord says that when you're standing before the rulers, you don't have to think, I'll give you the word. That word will come to you, but it is not something without labor. You have to be on your knees to ask God for it and then it shall be given unto you. Now let's go to the next point. What uh, uh, is there is watching over the sheep. So I will show you a picture of uh, uh, the, 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 she, uh, the shepherd later who is watching over the sheep. So it's a, uh, it's a night and uh, what happens is in the night, it is not easy to be sitting like this. You know, just look at that shepherd. You look at him, look at his eyes. He is wide open, eyes are wide open. The sheep are near him. He is watching out over the sheep. He is seeing that. There is danger, and he is trying to see, make remedies for that. And when Jesus was born, we see in Luke chapter 2 and verse 8, we see that blessed verse, which says that there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. So this watching has to be more in the night. Why it has to be more in the night? The danger is more. What is the happening is it is going to be a time where the visibility is less. And that is when the wild animals will creep in from any angle. It could be from the back. It could be from the front. So he has to kind of have a 360 degree view so that nothing attacks. So that is the word which has to be uh, uh, done, uh, work which has to be done by the shepherd watching over the sheep. So 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2 and 3, they watch over souls. It is not sheep. It is souls. It's much more precious than a sheep. So the work which is being done is something which is much more precious than what a shepherd in does in the field. Let's read 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2 and 3. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy liquor, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords of a God's heritage, but being ensembled to the flock. So we see very clearly that it is not for money's sake, not for filthy lucre. They, even if you don't get a pie for that, there is a reward in heaven. Don't worry about what will come to you. It is sometimes you will never get paid for these work. But the Lord knows. The Lord will reward according to his riches. We have all been experiencing the goodness of the God over all these years. You turn back and look at your own life, where you were and where you are. How you started and how you are. He has been our Ebenezer. So he and the shepherd watches over souls with that, with that great interest with a great a desire that they don't stray away, they don't get attacked, all these things they do. 
Now let's go to the next thing a shepherd does for his sheep in the local assembly, praying. It's linked with prayer, Ephesians 6 and 18, please. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Yeah. So uh, it is something which uh, is not just for one saint, for all saints. See, uh, when you look at uh, the efforts which you do in prayer, many are on their knees for hours together because they are praying for all saints. But there are people who finish their prayer in probably five minutes because they are missing out certain components in the prayer, which is not uh, addressing all the saints. You have to take them name by name in your assembly. And it is not only really the responsibility of the elders to pray for, it's the responsibility of all brothers and sisters to spend time for each other. Take the address book and start with that today. And you'll see much blessing. If there is dearth of something in your assembly, you start first. If you think that there is, the singing is so bad, what are you doing about it? You start doing something about it. If you think the Sunday school is not in a right shape, what are you doing about it? Are you praying about it? Or are you going and criticizing that he do, uh, doesn't take the class properly? So there are so many things which has to begin with us, which will lead to better things. Suppose there is dearth of money in the assembly. You start giving, others will follow you. So you have to be the first. And main thing is that we have to uh, be in prayer like the prayer, like a prayer warrior. So I'll come back to the word tending. Brother, the reference is 4011. I just missed a zero, but the value of zero you can realize now. Let's read that verse before we move to the next one. It's Isaiah 4011. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. Yeah. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom mm -hmm. and shall gently lead those that are with him. So there is not only feeding, you know, carrying it in his bosom. Mm -hmm. There are times when you need better tending. You have to bend down, take the lamp and hold it so that it needs the required attention at that point of time. And also, there are a lot of things associated with tending, but do, uh, we will just proceed forward. So just remember 4011 and let's see how best we can be like the great shepherd who takes the lamb into his bosom and does every care which is needed at the right time. The next point is guarding. We saw that the vigil continues throughout the night. There is guarding. Dangers multiply in the night. Vision is impaired. But then the shepherd watches over the flock by night. And the same thing with us during the night watches. Are we in prayer for those sick in our assembly? Are we in prayer for the elders and the deacons? Are we in prayer for the children? Are we in prayer for the youth? Are we in prayer for the needy? Are we in prayer for those who need marriage, partners, all those things? We have to have that vigil by night. And there is a God who is always attentive to the cry. Psalm 34, his ears are open to the cry. And there is sufficiency when you are guarding. No enemy is going to attack the flock if you are guarding. If you let your guard down, it is something which is going to affect you and also the sheep. Let's look at the next point. It is like the pastoral responsibility contains governing also. But when you govern, you don't, you are not like a, uh, you know, cruel general or a, a, a soldier or somebody like a big king because you are one among everyone, not as lords, but as examples. We have seen that yesterday, so we'll not take that reference. We have to govern and if you expect somebody to do something to you, you have to do the same thing. Then only you will get back whatever you expect as a behavior. Next is steering. You know, a ship is steered 
by what? It has a rudder. It's a small thing. And the person who is, uh, you know, steering the ship or, you know, we can call that word as a helmsman. He sees and changes direction whenever it is required. Let's read Acts 27 and 11, please. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the honor of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. Yes. Now let's go to stewarding. We have a lot of uh, parables uh, which have been told by the Lord Jesus Christ about stewards. So the first example which comes to our mind is the servant of Abraham. He was a good steward. He could give the responsibility of choosing the bride for Isaac to him 100%. So today, if a marriage is coming, do you kind of outsource everything to your uh, steward or do you do it yourself? But a nice and good steward, he will be expected to do everything what the master wants. And he's accountable. When he set forth to look forward for a bride, he was in prayer. And that prayer enabled him to do the stewardship in a right way to find the right bride at the right place and bring the lady, uh, the, the girl for uh, the bride for Isaac to the tent and he was accountable. Let's read Titus 1 and 7, please. For an overseer must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-will, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy liquor. So the word is here to be a just steward. And a steward takes care of all the things which are needed to see that the right things are available at the right time. The right person is available at the right time. And he kind of is like a coordinator who will make everything to happen so that everything is in place. Let's go to the next point. This is of rewards. So we have seen so many points about the pastoral responsibility. What is the reward which you get? So the reward is mentioned by Peter. First Peter 5, 4. It says very clearly, those who are striving as shepherds will be rewarded. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. See, when you look at crowns, who are crowned? The kings are crowned. Here, you have a shepherd who will be crowned. Gone are the staff. Gone are the rod. Gone are his clothes. He is royalty now. He'll be crowned. And that crown, I've put a picture there. It's only a very bad representation. But just to remind you, all who are laboring, and all who want to become an elder tomorrow, there is a special crown which is reserved for you. And that will be given for the shepherd, for his heart of service, for his love which he has shown, it will get him a shepherd's crown. So you may not get anything here, but there's a crown, a crown which is associated with royalty, a crown which is associated with recognition, and it will be given in front of all the saints. So don't worry, there is enough time for everybody to receive his crown. So don't worry, we have eternity. So if you have to stand in a queue to get the crown, so be it. But there is a shepherd's crown. Let's look at church, the local church. Some people think of the church as a big organization. But I would like to counter it by saying, Church is an organism. An organism is a living thing. And an organism will have one head. I wonder sometimes how God created organisms. Putting a brain inside something which is so small like an ant. It is sometimes so wonderful how God plants a brain on such a small flight, 
how does a mosquito can you measure it's not even you know one millimeter that head but in that there is something which gives it the intelligence like a drone to go to a particular destination to suck blood and you know spread all the malaria so church is an organism let's not use the it church is not a mosquito but what i'm saying is it's an organism with one head and one head is the chief shepherd when you look at an organism i am an organism but i have one head but the head controls each and every movement what happens when a person gets a stroke or what happens when a person is afflicted by palsy the lord you know healed one like that and he couldn't even walk into the room he was let down by four ropes and a bed and that control system which was required was switched off but the lord switched on this control system again so that he could take the bed and walk so what a testimony that the head controls each and every movement in the local church the chief shepherd controls but you have to be in submission it is every member has to be in submission to the chief shepherd you have to dwell on the word of god to know what are the instructions when you buy a electronic equipment it is advised that you read the manual before you switch it on because you could make a mistake which will damage everything so leave it to the head to control each and every movement and you be in subjection and then the the control system will work perfectly so god is a god who has given us a will he is not forcing us and punishing us immediately otherwise if you have seen the old testament you know you don't do what he says and immediately you are punished you know the instances of usa there was a clear instruction you should not touch the ark and he forgot that he and when and tried to stabilize the unstable cart the result was disastrous but then today you have an ability and the knowledge and the understanding from the word of god from the messages you receive that how you should behave in the church of god and the head controls each and every movement an organism has one head and we are within the organism so when you are within an organism we are organs and we don't fight with each other and we are within so that as a organism lives you know when i'm talking i'm focused when all the organs you know my hands my my face everything is directed to a particular job within the uh, within my body so also the local church has to be behaving like that the organism has life but an organization has no life it has got something which is called a system they go by everything which is written down you see the denominations even every prayer is a system you know you can't pray in the spirit you know because whatever is printed only you can talk and there is such a, a hard and fast rule so that you can't move it's a system which is but the systems may be good but what happens is there is only the mind which works and the heart doesn't work the lord is one who wants worship from in truth and in spirit and it's not from the book and the printed word that everything works so the organization has only a system organization has no savior a savior is needed for an organism which is in trouble an organization is in not in par with the organism so let's go to the next point a building let's take a building a local church is like a building it has doors it has windows and when what happens if the glass door is broken you can always go and kind of uh, you know replace the glass what if the window has blown off after a big storm you can always uh, replace that window but an organism has organs so i cannot replace my nose if somebody cuts off my nose what happens i have to live without a nose if somebody cuts off my hand you know modern medicine has a lot of things but you'll not get the right 
hand, if it is cut off in the right way, it was used earlier. So what happens? The windows or doors can be changed with new ones, but mutilation happens if you remove an organ. If you remove an eye, I'm a one-eyed person like Moshe Dan, who was a general in the Israeli army. So if you remove an organ, what happens? There is a minus in the body. The, so, so the church is something which is, which is not something that everything can be replaced. It is there as an organ which has to perform its function and the church existence does not depend on ceremonies. Many have so much of ceremonies. You know, you have something which is laid down that at the eighth day, 10th day, uh, when you are uh, uh, at this age. And all those things are always put as ceremonies. And you have a lot of ceremonies which were associated, rituals which are associated with the Old Testament, which doesn't have a place in the local assembly. You see a lot of cathedrals which has been built. You see a lot of money which is flowing in. And even there is a country like the Vatican, which is a government. So church existence does not depend on all these things. You minus everything. It lives on. The church will live on even if all these things are taken away. So church of the living God is an organism and it does not depend on any of these material things. It will live on even if everything is taken away. What happened in, in, in Jerusalem? Everything was taken away. They were persecuted. What happened? The word of God spread throughout the nations. It is possible because it's God who is doing this work. Now let us come to the qualifications of uh, elders. So we see the first set of qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 to 7, and 3, 8, 8, uh, 3, 8 to 10, 12, and 13. We will go through it one by one. So you will get an idea instead of just reading it. You can read it later. So it says, <clears throat> husband of one wife. There is no place for polygamy in the New Testament. Husband of one wife. Your focus, your attention has to be with one person. It cannot be diverted. You have to have the purity in heart so that you see the young sister in a way that she is respected. The older women has to be respected, but one wife to be loud in a special way. Husband of one wife. He has to be vigilant. He has to be steady. He has to be calm. He has to see through the darkness. He has to be vigilant. He has to be ready. And he will be like a soldier on the Indo-Pak border. Always vigilant to see that no enemy creeps in. And he has to be for that. He just cannot be dancing at the border. He has to be steady. He has to be calm. And he has to be composed. And he has to be vigilant. He has to be sober-minded. When you say sober-minded, it has to be, you know, in a sense that you don't overdo things and underdo things. And when you are under the influence of wine, you lose your sobriety. You lose the power of thinking. And we see that the clear mind is required when you are leading. So especially before a great match is going to be played, the coaches see that the players sleep well so that the next day they can perform to their best of ability. So unless they are sober, if they are drunk in the night, next day they will be bowling all known, uh, no balls and the goals will not be shot. Everything would be a fiasco. So you have to be sober minded and you have to have good behavior. See, all these things, when a child is three years old, his whole thinking is formed. That's what they say. So parents and would-be parents, please note, whatever a child is going to become, all his things which are in his mind are basic foundation is laid by the time he's three. So if you want to show, see good behavior in your children, it has to be inculcated when they are around three years of age. That is what psychologists say. So good behavior continues because the correction was done at the time when it was required. 
So similarly, a elder has to be having good behavior. So there is something which you call a pedigree. That also matters. So families, please take care so that you produce outputs and have people in your family who have good behavior. And good behavior does not mean that you don't do certain things, but you do certain things which will be acceptable and pleasing. You can be rude every time. That's not good behavior. You can be uh, insulting every time. That's not good behavior. So good behavior is doing what is pleasing to the Lord. And you know, Jesus Christ, he grew in favor. So when you are to be in favor with God and man, there is a behavior aspect which is beyond what is normal. You have to be hospitable. See, uh, uh, I was just thinking, when was the last time I had somebody in my house for a meal? Now it's COVID time, but when the COVID is over, or whenever you have an opportunity, we have to be hospitable. We read about it in, uh, in Genesis. We read about it in Hebrew. So when the angels came, Abraham, he was so hospitable that he called these angels or whoever were the men who visited him to his whole house. And there was a preparation. There was his wife, Sarah, who did all the work. He did, got the material and the wife made the material and the recipe was ready. Everything was done. And there was a feast which was offered. So hospitality is something which needs sacrifice of time of both the husband and wife. So normally the husband will be very happy to uh, call people home, but the wife may not be uh, ready at that point of time. So we have to have a single mind that the hospitality is of utmost importance. So when you get a people home for a meal, you can talk to them. They'll listen to you. So Jesus was the uh, recipient of so much of hospitality by sinners and uh, the, uh, the publicans. But same way, we also need to be hospitable, share the good things. You know, the late Justice Uncle, uh, he used to tell me, come home for a meal. He did not say come home for a feast. So even a meal given at the right time, when somebody is visiting your assembly, take him home and give that hospitality, which will help him to experience your love and care for him. And because the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. So maybe that can be uh, seen as a point which we have to do. So now let us see the next point. He is apt to teach. It is not that only the elders can teach, the uh, gifted brothers can also teach, but he should be apt to teach. He should be able to labor in the word of God and he should be able to communicate. He should be a great communicator. Communication is the answer to many problems. You know, when if the internet is down, my communication breaks down. There is no words which will reach you if there is the communication links are broken. Keep the communication links open so that they will come to listen to you. It is not that you are forcing them. They will come and listen if you are apt to teach. The seventh point, not given to wine. You have to have a limit for everything. When Paul to told Timothy that you can have a little wine, it is like he was prescribing a medicine. You don't take a bottle of Benadryl and drink it from a, a whole Benadryl in one shot. It will kind of change your thinking. You'll go dizzy. You will not be able to perform your function. You give somebody who is inebriated, give him a needle and ask him to send, put a thread through that. He'll never be able to do that. So let us in, ensure that the people are taught in the way that they are not given to wine. And it's only, think of it as a medicine which is needed for some thing. And it is not something which has to be had on uh, account of any celebration. The Lord of God does not support that. Be no striker. So uh, when you are controlled by Satan, he will strike. There is physical violence. 
There is no physical violence. You can't even raise your hand in the church of God, in the local assembly. Everything has to be done in love. And there is nobody who is accepted as an elder if he's a striker who does physical violence. It is not a school where you go with a cane and you know, punish all the children. There is punishment, there is rebuke, but it has to be done in love with a hand on his shoulder. And he's not money mad. Money is not the end of everything for him. And it is the root of all evil and he's not money mad. The next point is he is patient. The patience is a virtue which all of us will need to have in very better measure. Our fuses have to be very long. It cannot be a short fuse person because if you are short fuse, if you are impatient, you will not see the beauty of it coming out. When I was small, we used to have roses in the garden. I used to go and inspect the rose and try to help it to open out. And the result was that flower never bloomed. You have to be patient. You have to be kind. You have to be gentle. He's no brawler. You know who is a brawler? You have seen brawlers in the street. They make a noise for each and everything. Today, you have brawlers on the internet. They'll write so many things against God's servants. And it is coming as a big bane today. And the brawling, not in the street, but brawling on social media. They are contentious people. They write things in the magazines today, which are against God's people. And there are people who supply these materials to these, uh, 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 these people who write all these things. And there is hush money, which is being paid so that they don't write like that. There are no brawlers in the church of God. And there is nobody who is appointed as a judge to correct all the things in all the churches. There are elders who will do so. Now, he also presides well over his family. He is a respected person. His ch children are orderly. His wife is orderly. There is peace in the ha family. And he presides well over the family. Then he is not a novice. He is not a mature convert. Just as soon as somebody accepts the, uh, uh, the Lord as his personal savior, he is not entrusted with a responsibility. He has to learn a lot before he has been to be interested. And eldership is a delicate position which needs maturity. Let's wait for him. Let us encourage the novice. Let us be with him. Let us teach him so that at the right moment, he can be lifted up. And 15, good testimony among the unsaved. What does your neighbor say of you? What does the classmate say of you? What does your office people say about you? What does anybody in the street say about you? What does the beggar say about you? What does the shopkeeper say about you? Are you giving the money in time? What does the banker say about you after taking a loan? So all these things, you have to have a good testimony, not only in the assembly, but also among the unsaved so that they may see your good works and may glorify the father. There's no distinction between small, great, rich or poor. Everybody is considered with the same respect. And there's yardstick is that. And we saw that uh, hospitality, we read that in Hebrews 13 too, you can read that and he does not strive. So we have all these things which can be divided into three main headings. One is circumstances, second is capabilities, and the third is character. Let's see, group these into uh, each of these three heads. Not a novice, it's a circumstance. Second thing is husband of one wife. The third thing is good testimony among the unsaved. So these are the circumstances. Now let's see the capabilities. The capabilities are in effective control over his own household. So he controls his household and presides over it well. The capability is a teacher. He should be able to impart instruction. And the third point is that you have to have character. The most important thing which you can lose as an elder is your character. The most important thing which you have as a member of the local assembly is character. The character list is so long. Let's see, he has to be vigilant. He has to be sober-minded. He has to have good behavior. He has to be hospitable. He has to be not to be given to wine. He has to be no striker. He has to be uh, not a lover of money. He has to be patient and he has to be no brawler. So this characters 
and the characteristics of an elder and a member of the assembly are all these which are much more than the things which you saw earlier. Now, let us see what Titus says. So Titus also has a list of things which is slightly different from what it is written in Timothy. So Paul says, you should not be self-willed or you should not be arrogant. He should not be soon angry, not hot-headed. You see that verse in Proverbs 8.20. We don't have time to see that. Lover of good. Lover of people. Lover of things. You don't, you don't uh, you know, waste your time with people. You supply love. You are a love factory. And you are somebody who is adding to value. So if you don't do value addition, the product is not accepted. So if you want to have value, you have to be lover of people and you have to be just and you have to be upright. You know, Second Samuel talks about that, how you can be, you have to be just. Even if you have 10 people, you have to be, and if somebody does a wrong, just because he's a rich man, you don't overlook that. But if the poor is there and he does something wrong, you'll go and slap him. No, you have to be just in your attitudes, just in your decisions, and you have to be upright. And then you have to be holy. You have to be pure. And finally, he says you should be temperate, self-controlled. You have to be cheerful. You have to be orderly. When was the last time you joked with somebody? So there is something which is uh, to be cheerful and you have to be orderly. You cannot have disorder and do the same things. So let's talk about deacons and we close. So deacons are a people who looks after the things of the assembly, a local assembly for all the material things and seeing everything is order. You know how Stephen was called. He was man full of the Holy Spirit. He was full of the word. And he was chosen to see that the, uh, the, the, uh, the problem which happened between the Greeks and the Jews, they have to, have to be resolved. So there is special mention of 3.8. We see that they are not to be double-tongued. Double-tongued is a uh, the problem of many people. People talk something here, talk something there. So we need qualified men to lead the church. It is better to have a few people who are qualified, who are good, rather than large member of unqualified people and too many cooks will spoil the broth. And we see that only gifted people which should share in the ministry of the local assembly and the Lord will raise people who would be gifted and who will be able to teach and a gifted teacher may not be an elder or a deacon, and an elder or a deacon may not be a gifted teacher, that is also possible. So that is nothing to worry about that. So we will see uh, this slide also. Let's look at the house of God as a uh, local church as a house of God. Let's quickly turn to uh, Genesis 28 and 17. We see Jacob dreaming at Bethel. He is running out of his father's house because he's scared of uh, Esau, his brother, he comes to Bethel and he sees the house of God as a gate to heaven. And the house of God is where God dwells. In the Old Testament, God dwelled among the people in the tabernacle and the Shekinah glory was visible and Moses' servant was used. And the house of God today is the local church. Let's close by reading Genesis 28, 17. We'll see what happened next uh, uh, after he came back from uh, Padanaram also. And he was afraid and said, how dreadful or fearful is this place. This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So the <laughs> local assembly, it just may be named Bethel, but it has to be the gateway to heaven for many. So, Jacob, when he came back, he remembered that he had a stone initially. But what did he erect when he came back? He erected a pillar and offered sacrifice. So here is a person who was sleeping on a stone. When he came back with full realization, he erected a pillar and he offered the sacrifices there and he praised God. But then that was the place where he saw Heaven opened, angels ascending and descending. And he said, this is the place where God is. And this is the house of God. How privileged are we to be in the house of God? Let's continue the study. 
thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you, for brother, for helping me in reading the portions. And may the Lord bless you and give you the illumination of his truth so that we may be better members of the assembly, we may be better elders, and maybe better deacons in the days to come. Thank you once again. God bless you. And may his name be glorified from now and forever.